sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, Myself and Mary this week uh, uh, last, uh, went down to the Riverland in South Australia um, because I had to tidy up a few outstanding business things from my business life six years ago. And, uh, and so we finished up flying down to Adelaide and then travelling down to Loxton where I was born. And uh, we did a little tour. I, Mary's never been there, you see, so we did a little tour around of uh, where I was born and where I grew up and things like that. But unfortunately what happened was that we finished up going to bed after midnight each night and getting up at seven, <laughs> seven in the morning, so we were a bit, bit tired actually. Um, but we've done a, quite a lot of travelling in that time. And uh, in part of that process we, we actually... Um, one of the places where I was born was... A, uh, when, uh, straight after I was born my parents and I lived in a... Nissan hut. Has any of you heard what a Nissan hut is? Yeah, it's like a, um, it's like a, well, it's like this. It's sort of, so it's like a, a thing like that with a little door at the front and usually two little windows right there <laughs> and all of this is just tin. Like a long, yeah, and, we, and in the Riverland they call them a Nissan hut. And, uh, and in 44 degree heat, <laughs> inside of one of those, you can imagine what it was like. And back then we didn't have any fan or any air conditioner either, so it was like, so, so we were rarely in the hut, as you can imagine. <laughs> but I, I, can, I still have a few memories of that. And uh, anyway, Mary had never seen one of those, so we actually found the one that I actually lived in that's still up. So, yeah, so there you go. And uh, so we... And then uh, we went to a house, it was a housing commission house that we lived in in Loxton and, and uh, ironically it's for sale right now. Yeah. So I said, Mary, do you want to buy it for investment? <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good investment, trust me. So, uh, so that's where we've been the last week and we, cut, we got home uh, Thursday and stayed in Brisbane Thursday night and then drove up here yesterday. But... Uh, in that process, I got to meet obviously uh, my a bit of my family again, and uh, and also some family friends that we had when th from 30 years ago. So, so that was an interesting little process, um, and uh, we spent a bit of time with my my mum and dad, and and also my brother. So that's what we did in the last couple of weeks. Um, how's your last couple of weeks been? What we found in that process of travelling was that um, it's amazing how law of attraction events occur even in your day-to-day -day life that you might not think would occur even when you're travelling and doing other things. And if, if you're unwilling to get into the emotion of it, it gets pretty tricky after that, doesn't it, like a lot of times. And so the key is to stay willing to get into the emotion. So what we find is that... Uh, um, you know, sometimes we're crying in the motel room or whatever else when we're dealing with different things or while we're driving or whatever. And the key is just to let the emotions come up while they're presented to you. Because if you don't do that, what happens is there's going to have to be some time in the future that you get the same situation presented to you again. And, and if the emotions are coming up while it's presented to you and you deal with the emotion there and then, your law of attraction changes from that, in, from that point on. So that's, that's wonderful and that's what we've found over our trip. Lots of different things come up for both of us and just work, working our way through them now even still. And today, what I was going to do today was uh, open it up uh, for questions and answers today. And specifically, there's been a lot of people asking a lot of questions about Things like the Bible, questions about you know, what was said in the Bible, what wasn't said. And rather than type up answers individually, I would like to address the answers so that you know, we can get... What I'm finding a lot is that I get a lot of emails where people have asked very specific personal questions. But I know that there are like 100 people who have that particular personal thing happening in their life. And if I just respond to that one email, right, what actually finishes up happening is that 
there's only one person being helped by this information that could be helping 100 people. Does that make sense? So what I would like to do in the future is as much as possible address your questions in a public forum. Now the issue that many of you have with that is that I don't want my personal life on display for the rest of, like, you know, for the thousands of people that might get a DVD. So there's a lot of that kind of emotion in us. And the key is to stop, is to work our way through the emotion of that. Like, why is there this resistance to feeling that um, my stuff is personal and, and therefore I shouldn't share it in a public way and I've got to ask AJ privately. There's another emotion that I'm finding happening quite often too and that is that many times, many of you come up and ask me a question that has already been addressed in one of the DVDs or in one of the presentations. But you feel that because I didn't specifically address your information that there's something about your particular thing that I didn't understand and there so far would have, therefore would have given a different answer. And, and I finish up just giving the same answer that I gave in the DVD, which often is the answer that you wanted to reject in the first place. So <laughs> what, I, what I want to do is ask you, when you notice that happening, is to go back and find out why you've got to actually get this personal, like have the personal chat with myself when a lot of times all of the principles of what you're bringing up have already been addressed. Does that make sense? If they've already been addressed, allow, allow them to start settling within you as, and apply it to your own situation. Because to be frank with you, many of our situations are not really as personal as we think. Many of us have multi-generational issues that are the same as many other people's multi-generational issues and therefore we often have this constant uh, emotion that's there that's present in many other people that are surrounding us. And if we can allow ourselves to just take more notice of those things, it would actually reduce the amount of times that we need to ask personal questions. The third thing that I want to address is that many of you want one of the questions I've been asking primarily nowadays when people come up to talk with me is, have you talked about this issue with God? This is all about, the divine love path is all about you connecting with God, receiving divine love into your soul. It's not about you and, and, and something's <laughs> happening here. It's not about you and me as, and our relationship. It's about you and God. Um, one thing that's been happening recently is we've uh, got a lot of donations and, um, and we've managed to start buying some sound equipment, but unfortunately they've sent me the wrong sound equipment, so that means that I've got to send it all back and, uh, and so we were hoping that by this weekend we could have some different uh, sound equipment happening, but um, what we're doing is buying these little earpiece things and ones around there like that so it's nice and clear. Um, but, but it's not going to happen this weekend by the looks of things or perhaps even by the following one because apparently we've got to get them now from overseas because the ones that they sent were the wrong ones. So we'll see what happens there. Myself and Mary's law of attraction with electronics is pretty poor at the moment <laughs> um, and we don't know why that is so we're still working through the emotional issue but we actually bought a phone system recently that had an answering system on it and it worked for two days and then it just stopped answering calls and allowing us to ring. Right. Anyway, so we disconnect the phone system and, and, and everything works fine. The, the phone system itself actually works fine too, so we can't even take it back to get a repair or anything like that. Um, and so we've got all this electronic stuff happening with computers and, and phone systems and we really would like to sort it out before we buy too much more. <laughs> so we'll see what happens there. One thing I can feel from many of you today is a feeling of a bit, a bit, a bit of a depressed mood. What's that about? What's going on there for you? Would you like? Would some of you like to share about what's happening there? Um, if we come microphone just straight down. If you keep your hand up when you put up your hand, that'd be good. Well, with me, and I'm sure it's the same with lots of other people. We're just stuck on the emotions. You know, initially, you could go. You could, you know, do some little ones and move forward, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, just a brick wall. Right. Nothing. So that's what you find. Is many of you finding that yeah. just feeling and, a bit. And sucked? I'm finding that life is just becoming so busy. Yeah. So you're not even putting the time aside to do it. Yeah. So then you get 
frustrated with yourself because you're not connected with God. And then you start feeling a bit down about yourself yep. and then a bit self-attacking and then a bit like blaming of self. Is that where many of you go as well? No? Just disappointed with myself. Disappointed with yourself, mm. yeah. Let's, let's talk about that for a bit in terms of how to work your way through some blockaged emotions, right, shall we? So, so we all know that if we start inside of ourselves, we've got these core emotions, haven't we? The core causal emotions, which are all childhood-based. So they are the emotions that we're, we're focusing on in the end. These are the emotions that create our law of attraction. So every single thing that happens in my life is based around those emotions. But then we have on top of that, we have this layer of suppression, if you like, which is really just a layer of fear, right? Uh, just a layer of fear suppressing and keeping these emotions under control. And then we often don't want to feel our fear because fear feels terrifying for most of us. And so what we finished up doing is covering the layer of fear with anger. Right, so many of us then get into this, oh, straight into anger before we even realise it. Right? And then we can even go further in our suppression and get into a state where we feel depressed and down. All right, so that's basically the string of emotional processing that happens in terms of what's going on. And obviously nothing is going to change very much in my law of attraction until I can actually access these causal emotions that create my law of attraction. Now, some of the things that create my law of attraction are also regarding my fears, particularly if they're childhood fears. So you could say that I at least need to start getting here before my law of attraction is going to change, and I definitely need it at some point to get here. But the big problem is, is that most of our lives we have spent denying these causal emotions. We've spent most of our lives just keeping them heavily under control, suppressed and in such a manner that we don't even want to be aware of them. We want to keep them even out of our intellectual awareness even. We don't want to even admit most of the time that we have them, right? Now, because of that, that then just sets up this chain where we start generating other types of emotions in order to avoid these emotions. So often when myself or Mary feel stuck, what we try to do instead of trying to access that emotion, we try to admit to ourselves what is it that we're actually afraid of here, what's actually stopping me from accessing this emotion. Now, when initially when you start your emotional processing work, you have a whole group of emotions that are pretty easy. And when I say pretty easy, you might cry for 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, half an hour, and the issue is sort of pretty much done. It feels like it's shifted, your law of attraction changes, and all of a sudden you, you, know, you have some shifts occur in your life and you know that that particular issue is gone. And so we're ploughing our way through lots of these different things, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Now, that, that's fine. We think, wow, this is working really good. Isn't this so easy? How many of you have felt that in some point in your processing? Oh, this is really, really easy. How many? Quite a number have felt that, right? Then we get to our first big emotion. Right? Our first big emotion. Like, let's say one of them might be, say, the emotion of rejection. You know? Now, not many of us want to feel like everybody's rejected us. So we don't want to go that, there. So now what's happening is that we start, because of this big emotion, it's been there all the time, it's been there in our life all the time and it's been there right from our childhood in most cases, but because it's now the first big emotion that we're really quite afraid of, we're really quite terrified of it, what happens now is we have a tendency to go into anger. Right? So how many of you have found that you've processed a while, all right, not too much anger, not too much anger, and then all of a sudden now you feel angry all the time, like you just want to get into a rage with every man who comes along or every woman who comes along, you just want to get into a rage with them. And that is because there's a bigger issue. There's a big issue now that's come to the surface. It's ready to be processed, by the way. So don't assume that just because you're getting angry it's not ready. It's ready to be processed but there's a lot of fear that I'm denying about the issue. Right? So the, the problem that we face all the time with all these emotions is that 
is that we get to the point where this emotion is obviously been in us for a long time and it feels good to even keep it in us to a certain degree. Does that make sense? Because if we let go of this emotion, then we don't even know who we are anymore. That's how big some of these emotions are. They're like huge identity crushes. Right? That's what they feel like. That if I let go of this particular emotion, I won't even know who I am. No one else is going to ever accept me either and I won't even be able to accept myself because I don't even know who, who that will be. And yet they're the core emotions that need to leave us in order for everything to become more blissful in our lives. So what happens is there's this deep level of fear and to be frank with you, I'd, I'd actually most of the time call it uh, terror rather than fear. Right? Many of you know what ter the difference between terror and fear? Like fear usually is bearable in the sense that we actually live around fear or we change our lives to suit, the uh, to suit our fears. But terror has usually one of a couple of responses. One of them is we just sit in one place shaking, not being able to do anything. Just like a frightened animal does, right? When it just sits there shaking and... And in fact, if an animal is so terrified, I don't know if you noticed, but in the bushfires down in Victoria, for example, uh, was it last year or the year before now, um, many of the animals were so frightened that the fire uh, officers could just go and pick them up and put them, put them somewhere because they were just so terrified. Uh, and that's how we get when we get so terrified. We get into this place that, that we don't know what to do and we don't know where to go and we don't... Ha now, we also have two other responses and that is a fight or a flight response when we start feeling terrified. So when I say a fight response, that's where we want to go in defence mode and, and usually the best form of a defence is attack, right? So what we do is we go into attack mode where we're defending our castle and what we're going to do is just attack everyone else. Or we flee. And that's one thing we often do too. We get into a situation where we're getting very, very, very close to dealing with an emotion and it gets so intense that we just want to get away from the emotion. And so what we do to lessen the pressure inside of ourselves is we flee the situation. Even just getting into another room can get us out of that close proximity to the emotion. Or sometimes all we need to do is get up and get a cup of tea or get up and get a drink or get up and go for a little walk and then we're back down to calm again. And we think, oh, now that's, oh, I can manage that. Right? But remember I said some time ago that unless the soul expands, it's not going to be able to cope with some of these emotions. And the only way the soul expands is by being overwhelmed. You remember that? And so many of us are not allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed with the emotion. We still want to control the emotion. And... What, when we want to control the emotion, instead of punishing yourself for wanting to control the emotion, look at the reasons why you want to control the emotion. Does that make sense? Now, what could be some of the reasons why I would like to control an emotion? Any ideas? You can just yell them out if you've got them. Just one-liners. Uh, so there's some addictions that I want to hold on. That's a good one. So... So in other words, I, I'm afraid to deal with the emotion. So what I do is I create an addiction and that addiction is a projection at another person that they have to do something in order for me to feel good, basically. Or I have to have that particular thing or that particular comfort in order to feel good. And so what I do then is I focus on getting the addiction. If the addiction is not met, what do I do? I get angry. I get angry with my situation or I get angry with the person who doesn't meet my addiction. I, something happens like that, right? So, so if I'm wanting to avoid the fear of the causal emotion, I will get into a place of addiction and then when the person doesn't meet my addiction, I then get in a rage with the person or I just say, oh, I don't like that person anymore. I'll go off and you know, stay away from that person from now on, right? And all that's doing is avoiding the fact that I have an addiction that is overcoming, in, it's an intellectual attempt or to really overcome a fear. And the fear, uh, when I say an intellectual attempt, it's really, an addiction is really an emotional attempt to overcome a fear 
by getting somebody else to do it for you, really, or something else to do it for you. So, so that's one certain thing that I could do. I could become focused on the addiction and getting what I need out of an interaction. And the problem with that is it helps me avoid what I'm afraid of and therefore avoid the causal emotion. So if I am in a state where I notice I have the addiction, I am far better off not acting upon the addiction. Can you see that? But most of the time, what do we finish up doing? We finish up acting upon the addiction because that's what we're used to doing ever since we can remember. And that's a great way to get out of the emotion. Is there any other reasons why I'd be afraid? A change, okay. Afraid of change. Many of you have already experienced some change in your lives and where other people have judged you for that change that you've made, right? So you start making some change. Other people around you, they don't get along with you as much anymore because they're not as connected emotionally and they get sick of you being with you because every time you get together, you start talking about emotions and they're tired of you talking about emotions. They just want to get back onto talking about their addictions usually, right? And, and instead of dealing with their emotions. So, so they start projecting at you. You know, you're an idiot now and this AJ fella, he's an idiot as well. And, and, you know, they go down this road now of starting to project a little bit of anger and frustration with you, right? Now, if that's how much anger and frustration you're getting now, imagine what it's going to be when you're actually further progressed. So you see, a lot of us start comparing and we start comparing inside of us and we say, well, if... I've hardly made any shifts and yet this is happening. What happens if I make all these shifts? I'm going to have the whole world upset with me at some point. That's the, that's the feeling we often have, right? And by the way, you might, right? The first people who do this are always going to have the most opposition to doing it because we're, we're basically dealing with the entire opposition of the world against dealing with some groups of emotions. Does that make sense? So what we finish up doing is we become so afraid to change, we now stay in this fear and whenever anybody challenges this change with us, we skip back into the anger. And that is not dealing with the core emotion. I need to acknowledge that this is what's going on for me. I need to look at that. Katrina, you wanted to ask a question? If we just go, if you keep your hand up there. Yeah, it's specifically about this topic. I've just had a situation with, well, who I thought was a friend, exactly what you've described. Um, I've been really deciding I have to speak the truth all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was very honest with this friend about a situation between us and their child. Mm -hmm. And they got into full-blown personal attack because I mentioned the word God yeah. and truth and in one sentence. <laughs> God's very triggering. <laughs> and they gave me a full frontal personal attack. And, um, and then it came back a second time. And I actually asked them, could you, that you're, emotion, you're angrily projecting at me. If you could stop the uh, angry projection, I could actually talk about this more. Yeah. And I really went into complete terror because yeah. of my father. I'm going to cry now. Yeah. Hold on. and yeah. I've processed heaps of it yeah. but clearly it's not gone yeah. but I said to this man um, I'm no longer willing to be in your company if you're going to be so angry at me mm. because you're not being responsible and I didn't cause what's inside you which made him even angrier yeah. but I really feel in my heart that I am loving myself by saying no to the projection yep. Is that true or am I just hiding from more terror? That's my confusion. No, you are being loving to yourself in, in, in saying no to the projection. But the issue is still to feel the terror you feel. Which I Which am doing all I am. I'm talking to God very regularly about it. That's it. And I have gotten into it very um, intensely and gotten into some causal things. Yep. And now I'm afraid of the projection and less terrified but I'm still in fear. Yeah. And, and when you look at um, people judging you, a lot of times, and this is something to bear in mind for all of us, a lot of times when people judge you, which is really what this person is doing, they're judging you and a lot of your motives for what you're doing, and when somebody judges you so severely, 
It's actually a reflection of how much self-judgment we actually have and hold on to inside of ourselves generally too. Does that make sense? So what happens is if somebody says to me, you know, you're a bastard, AJ, if I've got a lot of self-judgment, I will actually in that moment feel like I am a bastard. Do you know what I mean? They'll feel those feelings that, yes, they're right. Maybe they're right. Now, many of you have this going on as a playing, playing as, a, as an issue for you, is that, that whenever somebody else says something about you, that you then feel inside of yourself initially that it means that they might be right or that they are right. right? And then what happens is we go intellectually, no, 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 that's not right, that's not right. And then what we try to do is you know, defend the fact that no, that's not right. When in reality what we need to do is allow the feeling inside of ourselves that they are right and fully process that from an emotional perspective. Does that make sense? So a lot of times what we finish up doing is we, we, we try to actually get away from the projection coming at the person and we deal with the emotion of being attacked, which is another emotion that we have generally, but we don't get to that underlying emotion of how much we actually finish up attacking ourselves, right? Which is actually the core emotion inside of us. The core emotion is that we have a lot of grief usually and a lot of self-attack going on. And so therefore when anybody says to us something that's degrading to us, we instantly become upset inside of ourselves because... The truth is we're believing at some level that they're right. right. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, how do you release a belief like that? The answer is only by feeling that it's right, that it's right. Allow the emotional of error to release. And then as you're praying about that issue, you'll find you'll get confirmation that it's actually wrong, but but not here. It won't be intellectual confirmation that that projection was wrong it'll be a firm feeling inside of yourself that comes from god no actually that's not what you're really like that actually enters you now once that feeling settles inside of you somebody can say exactly the same thing about you and it will have no effect emotionally on you whatsoever right and you'll be able to just smile and say that's okay you're allowed to think that or whatever and it won't have any other effect. So the key is to allow yourself to see how you view yourself in these interactions. And the layer of emotions that are causal, in the end, all many of them look at how you see yourself. But let's make it a bit more personal. How I see myself. Right? And most of the huge emotional reactions that we have to any single event or situation are linked to an issue with how we see ourselves in that particular interaction. Now, so if I get a person attacking me, let's say somebody says to me a few weeks ago, somebody's told me that I'm uh, self-delusional and narcissistic, uh, selfish, and he, he said quite a few other things uh, among the same, along the same lines. Now, I know that I'm not selfish because I know how much you know, I give to others and how much I want to give to others without expecting anything back and all of those kind of things. And I know I'm not narcissistic. In fact, I'm totally the opposite to it because I want no power whatsoever and uh, I want to avoid all situations of power and control. And I know that I'm not uh, self-delusional because I can remember what I can remember. Right. So I could actually go into this defence process. Does that make sense? Of saying, of going back and sort of denying all of the accusations coming at me, and then and then uh, you know then going into the emotions that caused that man in this case to to tell me all of these things about myself, which was unsolicited at the time, and I could actually um, go through all of all of that process, which would all be a denial of what's really going on within me. What's really going on within me is, one, a fear, a fear of being perceived when I know some truth, a fear of being perceived as arrogant. Now, many of you have this same fear, right? You're afraid of telling the truth because the other person might then say that you're arrogant. 
and say, you know, all these different condemn you for you knowing some truths that perhaps they don't know. And so I, I also have that emotion. And so there was a great big terror involved in that. In the first century, it caused my death, actually, the accusation of arrogance, because I, I was accused of, uh, being, of saying that I was God. When I said I was God's son, I was accused of saying that I was God, that that meant I was saying that I, I was God, and that, that also meant that I was saying that I was better than everyone else, which is not what I was saying, and it's not even what I felt. I was just saying, this is the relationship that happens when you become one with God. Does that make sense? But, but because of everyone's emotional judgment of themselves, whenever I say, I'm Jesus, there's this automatic thing that goes on in their mind. Is, oh, so you're saying you're better than me then? No, I'm not saying I'm better than you. Like, how do you get I'm better than you from the words, I am Jesus? The only way you get from I, from I am Jesus to... I'm saying I'm better than you, is a lot of emotional filters in between, isn't there? There has to be, because they're totally different words, aren't they? Right? And they must mean that they enter us emotionally, and then we have all these reactions inside of ourselves emotionally. You see what I'm saying? So, so when I get somebody saying to me, I'm narcissistic, I need to feel my emotions about what this ac accusation is about. Now, when I get these, some of these accusations, I get into terror, Okay, so I've got to ask myself, why am I in terror about these people saying these things? And then when I start tracing that back, I can acknowledge the fear that I feel in that particular situation. I can acknowledge the fears of getting falsely accused about things. And also, I can start getting into the underlying emotions. Now, I can also start acknowledging that some of my own beliefs about myself... If I speak the truth all the time, everyone else around me is not going to like me. That's one belief. It's a false belief, but it might be a belief we have inside of ourselves, you see? And so that belief could be being triggered. So the key is to ask yourself, how, with everything that comes at you, what is this reflecting back at me about how I see myself? And there's always the primary grief is always about yourself. Do you follow me? That's usually the primary grief. Like, why am I grieving that I got abused by my father? Because it changed how I see myself. Right? It distorts how I see myself. Why am I grieving because my partner left me? Because it changed how I viewed myself. Because when a partner leaves me, I now feel that no man's ever going to want me anymore or no woman's ever going to want me anymore. That's how I see myself. And I'm grieving about that. So how do I see myself is a core part of your emotional processing. So if you're tempted to get into anger with regard to emotions, it's because you don't want to see how you actually see yourself. You don't want to see the truth about how you treat yourself in these particular interactions. And when that happens, what we finish up doing is living in the fear or the terror and then, of course, wanting to get away from that fear or terror by using all sorts of techniques. Total suppression gets us into depression. Total, total addictive behaviour gets us into this anger Anger happy, anger happy, anger happy type cycle that many of us can get into quite easily where I'm happy as long as everything around me is working nice and smooth and as soon as something goes wrong, one thing goes wrong, I am now angry. Right? And then when that one thing pans out and fixes itself, I'm now happy. Right? Now, in the end, this won't happen to you. Things will go wrong in your life and you'll remain happy. But you can only do that by getting through that emotion and into the core emotion of why you're trying to control the environment. And the way, reason why we can try to control our environment always eventually gets back to how I'm seeing myself. Now, that, that's the real core issue for most of us to face, how, how I see myself. Now, when a person, in, in Katrina's example, a person comes and attacks her, What's happening is this is connecting with some old stuff inside of you about how a man sees you and so therefore how a man, how you see yourself when you're with the man. Does 
that make sense? And that's what it's really connecting to. And that's the thing that needs to be released. When that's released, no matter whether the man is angry or not, you will still feel peace within you. And you'll be able to then, in that particular space, even stay in an angry situation with peace inside of you. When I say stay in it, I don't mean that you'll stay in it permanently. I mean there's all sorts of situations that will come up in your life where you could choose anger and instead, because this emotion is now gone from you, you would, you'll be in peace in that situation. You won't want to decide to stay in it permanently, of course. So if someone's permanently projecting rage at you, you'd say, well, now you're just wasting my time. Because <laughs> it is a waste of, some, of your time and theirs for you to just try to defend anger all the time. So after a while, you won't want to attract those kind of people anymore and you won't feel attracted to them. And in fact, they won't even be attracted to your life very much at all. But if you, if you see that it's all related to how I see myself, then it will help you a lot to actually process through the emotion. And that's what's helped me so much with all of my stuff, is that every single time I get a projection from others, I'm going, all right, this is how I see myself. There's something in how I see myself here. And that's why very few of you ever feel a projection coming back from me, no matter how you treat me. Because I'm always trying to own how I feel about myself here. Does that make sense? And when you can get into the practice of doing that, which is actually a practice of humility in the end, isn't it? When you can get into that practice and it becomes a part of your being, you'll find you'll rarely, if ever, get into anger and you'll always be seeing, all right, there's some grief in here about how I feel about me. Or, and by the way, if there's anger in you about how you feel about you, <laughs> that's not the same as grief in you about how you feel about you. So many of us have a temptation to get into anger with ourselves. And if you have a temptation to get into anger with yourself, you are still denying a fear about yourself and therefore also still suppressing the grief about yourself. Does that make sense? So if, if I'm finding I'm getting angry with myself or another person, then in that moment I am creating a self-deception in order to avoid the true feeling the fear-based feeling that's covering the core emotion. Now, every time you feel drawn into defending yourself, that is an excellent time to look at your own actions. Because at that moment that you are defending yourself, you are usually defending your own fear of being perceived as something that you actually believe inside yourself is true anyway. So... In other words, somebody says to you, oh, you know, um, you know when you did that, you had a bad intention. You wanted to, you wanted to hurt me. You wanted to punish me. You, you know, and they're saying all these different things to you. You could then go and, okay, you could go into two places here. You could either go and, oh, maybe I did want to punish them. Maybe I did want to punish them. Or you could go into this place of, no, I didn't want to punish you. No, I didn't want to punish you. Know, that you could go one of those two ways generally. And in the end, both directions are generally a denial of what I'm afraid of in my own causal emotion. If I allow myself to feel like, all right, they're saying to me that I wanted to hurt them, I don't feel like I wanted to hurt them, but that makes me feel terrible for some reason. Their accusation that I wanted to hurt them makes me just feel terrible. So what grief inside of myself am I resisting about myself? There's something inside of myself about myself I'm resisting. And what could that be? Well, it could be that I actually feel the terrible emotion about having harmed others in the past. A, t a terrible guilt that I carry with me. You know, something when I was three might have happened. Like, like I remember um, one of my boys once when he, was, when he was about three, he got a little budgie that we had as a pet budgie and crushed the head of the budgie in a window, right, because he wanted to see what would happen. Uh -huh. Now, when he saw the budgie die in his own hand, what do you think he felt then? Just, he felt terrible. And he went into almost total shutdown for quite a number of days. He wouldn't feel anything. He just stayed in his room. He was only a few years old and stayed in his room and just wouldn't feel anything. 
he tried to talk to me about it, he wouldn't talk about it. And then eventually after talking about it, he got to the point where he could grieve the fact that he did it. Does that make sense? And he eventually let go of all this guilt and sadness and how could I even done, have done that? Now, in our own past, many of, many of us have had these situations where we have done something unwittingly that created harm to somebody else. And then we carry, because these emotions are still within us, we carry them around and we, and we don't release them. And so when anybody then projects at us that we've harmed them, how do we react? Straight away we're up in arms, you know, like as if we're guilty for that particular thing as well. And we're guilty for that because we have this terrible feeling inside that we are. The key is to just allow ourselves to feel the terrible feeling inside that we are in that moment. But most of us don't do that. We, can, we go into defence. No, I wasn't harming you. I didn't try to harm you. And we go into panic and we try to like say, no, no, it's not like that at all. You know, please believe me. And we're saying all these things. But in reality, we're not allowing the belief about ourselves that has still unhealed from our childhood to just pop up in that moment. Does that make sense? And when we do, it might be linked to an event just like I described, where we did do some harm to something. And it had pain and we didn't realise and now we do and, and we had all this guilt and other emotions associated with it but we just don't release it. Right. So look at how I see myself. Ask yourself that question every time something happens that you want to defend. Yeah. Now does that get... Now all this comes back to that question you asked, Barb, about why am I stuck what, you know, when I feel down about myself. And that is, if, if we can stop trying to get at this. See, many of us, we're always trying to get here, right? Would that be right? We're always wanting to get to the causal emotion once we start getting on the path. But, you know, most of the time, the causal emotion will just pop up on its own if we get to this. You see? See, most of us don't want to get to that. We want to skip over that. Fear doesn't feel very good. So we want to skip over that and get to that. Does that make sense? But the problem is, is that that is what's creating everything above, the anger and the resistance and all the other things that we're feeling at the moment. It's actually this fear that we have that's creating that. And if I'm a male, sometimes it's very, very difficult to admit to myself that I'm even afraid of anything, let alone an emotion, right? And if I'm... Um, a female, often I'll admit that I'm afraid, but I'll live in the fear of it, where I just perpetuate the fear in my life. Right? So, so a lot of times we need to stop avoiding these fears and terrors that we have. So rather than trying to get to the core emotion, the best thing to do is this. If I'm not feeling the core emotion right now, it's because I'm afraid of it. It's quite simple. If I'm not feeling it right now, I'm afraid of it. At some level, I don't want to feel it. I'm afraid of it. And if I'm afraid of it, then what do I need to start addressing? What am I afraid of? Now, it might be I'm afraid that other people will notice and I'm afraid of their judgment. I might be afraid of my own judgment of myself. I might be afraid of change. I might be afraid of admitting, wow, I've actually got some sexual addictions or I've got some physical addictions or I've got some emotional addictions that really, once I start acknowledging them, feel pretty like, well, I'm not a very nice person at all. So, that, you know, there's some judgments in there that I'm afraid of. And all I need to do in the end is allow myself to release these fears and terrors that I have and the underlying emotion is just going to pop out of me, just like a child. Isn't that how a child works? Until you instill fear in the child, the child can feel its causal emotion straight away, can't it? As soon as you start putting fear layers or blockage layers on, or judgment layers on top of the child, what does the child now do? It can't feel its emotion anymore. This is what we've done. This is what's happened to us. So allow yourself to feel the fears if you're in a block state rather than trying to always get to the causal emotion. If we have a microphone over here. Thanks. Thanks, Aj. During the, the past two weeks, I've been trying to make lists with Ma which Maggie suggested uh, what what I was angry about, and I rarely feel angry. I might feel a mild irritation, mm -hmm. 
and and then what I was fearful about. And the, I, I managed to write some things down, and they generally come out to things like isolation or lack of purpose in my life or, or um, just, uh, you know, things that really... When I looked at the list, I thought, oh, for heaven's sake, smarten up and, and, and uh, stop being so self-centered. And that's sort of where, or self-absorbed, and, and that's sort of where I stop. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not sure what I'm doing at that point. Right. Let's just write down your words, smarten up. Yeah. Stop being self-centered. Yeah. Self-absorbed or self-centered. Yeah. Uh, any other judgments you had? I think no. May, I think uh, being indulgent. I think self-indulgent. Stop that's, being yeah. indulgent. Yeah. Indulgent. Indulgent. T e n t. Yeah. Indulgent. Okay. What are they? Judgments. Mm. Mm. When you judge yourself, you will always prevent causal emotion. And when you judge others, by the, by the way, that's exactly what you're trying to do to others too prevent their causal emotion, right? So the truth is that every time we have one of these judgments, there is something inside of this. So let's look at smarten up. How many times were you told that when you were little? I don't remember. You I, don't? I, I don't remember very much about... About your childhood. About my early childhood, no. Exactly. I'd suggest you've been told it quite frequently, right? <laughs> Well, I know emotion wasn't uh, encouraged. Yes. Expression of emotion wasn't encouraged. And if, you, and if you felt like you disappointed any of your parents, what generally happened? I don't know. I can't remember. Can't remember. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so start with the current thing. So many of you can't remember your childhood, right? Forget about trying to remember your childhood. Start with your law of attraction right now with regard to these emotions, right? The law of attraction right now is you're telling yourself to smarten up. Right? That is a judgment of yourself. So why would you judge yourself? Let yourself feel about why. Does that feel like you're not smart? How do you feel about yourself, remember? So let's just rub the yourself out here. How I feel about myself. So ask yourself... With regard to when I say the words to myself, smarten up, how do I feel about myself? Well, I guess that, that I'm not either smart or not using the brains that I, that I have or, or I'm not making g good choices of use of my time or yep. whatever. And many yeah. your generation, by the way, used to get cuts or, or get a ruler across your hand at school mm. if you weren't smart enough, right? You didn't know the answer there on tap, bang. Oh, I can remember having to go around like classroom in grade five, looking at everybody's handwriting because mine was so terrible. You know? So they, the teacher got you and led you yeah. around. See, that's another person better than you. That's another person yeah. better than you. That's a, these kind of yeah. things happen to you all the yeah. time, right? In your childhood. That's another person. What does this do to you inside of you? It's like smarten up, smarten up, like this constant yeah. message. And what we finish up doing is because we don't release the event of that, we then perpetuate the same damage against ourselves. So this actually saying to yourself, smarten up, is actually the result of some very strong childhood uh, conditioning that occurred to, to teach you that under certain conditions you're not very clever. And, and, I, tr and I know in, within myself now as an adult, like I treat that as kind of a joke. Yeah, you and, know, and it's not a joke. No, it probably wasn't no, a joke. This is but a very, very damaging self-projection now. You're actually now re-damaging yourself with this same projection because, it, because it's unhealed from the childhood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at this stop being self-centred. So what you're really saying is you're, you're self-centred. Can you see that? Well, well, by spending so much time on, on trying to... to deal with your own situation when there are a lot of people out there that, you know, <laughs> you should be. And I think this is a Christian thing too, isn't well, it? That keep going, yeah, keep going. Very much you're that, actually that uh, you, you know, you, you suppress your own needs because there are lots of other people that need something more, much more than you do. Can you yeah. see where this is leading you? See, just by talking about, you know, why am I thinking I'm self-centered here, 
just by even speaking about it, you're starting to go down to these beliefs about yourself if you do something for yourself. That, that you're not really worthy to, to spend the time on. So how am I seeing myself? Yeah. I'm yeah. not worthy to spend this time on because if I spend this time on, I've got this judgment going on that I'm self-centred. Now that judgment had to come from somewhere. Yeah. The little child who's three having a tantrum in the middle of the floor doesn't feel that self-centred, <laughs> do they? They might remember. be self-centred, but they don't feel they are <laughs> in that particular yeah, moment, yeah. do they? They yeah. just feel their emotion. And if they yeah. let feel it completely, often it will pass in the half an hour, 20 minutes, even 10 minutes, and it's gone. Right? So, so me, whenever, whenever you're saying to yourself, stop being whatever, there's a judgment straight away there. Mm. So stop being indulgent. What's this one about? I think it's probably the same, same sort of thing that... Uh that if you spend a lot of time dealing with something inside of yourself to make yourself feel happier or better, that's self-indulgent. You've got to spend more time helping other people, less time on yourself. Yeah. Yep. And can you see where we finish up going with this if we really get intense with this? When we really get intense with this, you'll forget about yourself completely and you'll do as much as you can for every other person on the planet other than yourself. You will get to that point. But the mm. sad part of that is it creates lots of anger and rage and everything within ourselves. And it comes from how I see mm. myself in the end. I see myself as being indulgent as soon as I do anything for myself. I, I can see that being part of relationships I've had in, in the past too, in ter with men particularly, I think, and that was I, I would see more clearly how they felt and and then act on that rather than what they were doing to me. Yes. And how I felt. Major yeah. problem in relationships, isn't yeah. it? All right. Now all of these things are judgments that come from a fear. Can you see how these would be related to some kind of fears? So the smarten up judgment comes from the fear that you're not that clever. Mm -hmm. Right? The self centered judgment comes from a fear that you actually are self centered. Right? The stop being indulgent judgment comes from a fear that you are indulgent. Yeah, and, and maybe I think that I am those things. You definitely yeah. do think you yeah. are, otherwise you would never have said these things to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? The words coming out of your mouth even, or the thoughts coming out of your mind towards yourself are proof that you have these fears inside of yourself. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, every one of those fears covers a causal emotion. So what would the fear that you're dumb and silly cover inside of yourself? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that it's true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. So that I'm not smart. You, you believe you're not smart, yes. And in fact, it would be good for me to say to you, you're not smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and maybe I'd say maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and you would say maybe you're right, yeah, right? Yeah. Because that's you're your own right. belief about yourself. What I'm saying is that from God's perspective, you're as smart as anybody else. But that belief isn't ever going to end to you while this other belief is present within you. Does that make sense? It's never going yeah. to get there. It's n you can't have the truth and error in the same place from an emotional perspective. So what that means is inside of your soul, while you have this fear inside of you that you are actually stupid. But I don't believe I'm stupid. No, but then why would you tell yourself smart not? Well, just because how I'm handling my behavior, I think. So how are you handling your behavior? In a self-indulgent, uh, <laughs> self-centered way. Okay, well, let's yeah. look at self-centered then. <laughs> so you believe you're self-centered, do you not? Probably, yeah. <laughs> you know, you believe you're self-centered yeah. when you focus on dealing with your emotions, isn't it? Yeah. When you're out there helping everybody else, you're no longer believing you're self-centered. Yeah, but I you? don't think I'm helping everybody else well, very much. That's the addiction. Yeah. Can you see how the addiction kicks in? If I have a belief inside of me that maybe I am self-centered if I deal with my own emotions, can you see straight away that that's going to prevent me from dealing with my own emotions? It's going to actually make me go into the addiction, which is, 
okay, I can't deal with my own emotions. I'm better helping somebody else. So I'll go and help somebody else. And then I come home feeling really good. Oh, that was great. Didn't feel good, you know. Yeah. And, and can you see how the addiction works? Like the addiction is I feel great when I'm helping somebody else, but if I start to deal with my own emotions, I feel terrible because I've got all these judgments of oh, I'm self-centred if I deal with my own emotions. I'm indulgent if I deal with my own emotions. I've got to smarten up. What does smarten up mean? I've got to give more to others and less to myself. That's what it means in your mind mm -hmm. and therefore that's what it means in your feelings, in your soul. But at, at the present time I'm, I'm just stuck because I'm not doing either. Well, you're stuck because you're not acknowledging that these are truths that you believe about yourself. That when I say truths, they're not God's truth about yourself, yeah. but they are things you do actually feel about yourself deep in here. And I need to acknowledge them before they'll start to actually flow. Before they'll start to be dealt with, I need to acknowledge them. Does that make sense? I guess so, yeah. yeah. So, so what's happening is listen to your own language, like about yourself and your own language to others. Your language tells you a lot about your emotions, your true emotions. Right? And be honest about your true emotions. So... I've got this emotion that I've got to smarten up because I'm being selfish. So I actually do actually feel that at some level I am selfish. I've at least been condemned as being selfish at some point in the past mm -hmm. and I need to release that emotion. When I release that emotion, I'll no longer feel I'm selfish and ironically that's the time that I'll give the most to other people because I'm no longer having this terrible thing that happens every time I do something for myself kick in. You see, most of the time what happens is that somebody says something to me and because I've, unhealed, I've not healed the emotion inside of myself, I then want to either defend what they've said to me or I want to justify that it's not true and straight away that's an unloving act. I'm straight away in an unloving situation because I'm now projecting at that person. I'm now making that person believe something or that they already don't believe. I'm trying to change their mind. That's an unloving act too. At the end of the day, I need to get to back to myself, all right? How do I feel about their condemnation of me? Let myself feel. In your case, you're condemning yourself. And by the way, this is what we've been taught to do. All of us mm -hmm. have been taught to condemn yourself. From the time of your childhood onwards, you've been taught to condemn yourself so much that now even your parents may be dead and yet you still play the same message to yourself that they played to you when they were alive. That's how, that's how powerful this conditioning has been. Right? And we need to undo it by looking at how we see ourselves and feel that emotion. When we feel that emotion, it releases from us. When it releases from us, the truth about ourselves can enter us. God's truth I'm talking about, about ourselves, can enter us. But only when we release the emotion. So while you have an emotion that, that if I feel my emotions and I focus on my emotions and I'm being self-centred, that's going to prevent divine truth from entering you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? As soon as I get through that emotion that maybe I am self-centred, how you know, start reflecting upon you know, what you have learned through your life when you've been accused of being self-centred, and all those kind of things, let yourself start feeling about these events, release those events from you, you'll get to a point where you realise, hey, I'm not self-centred at all. Now, that, at this stage, that's here, but it certainly isn't here, because if it was here, you wouldn't even say that to yourself. Yeah, I, I don't remember being told that, and, and probably I was, but I don't remember It doesn't occasions. really matter what you remember. Mm -hmm. Start with what you've currently got. What yeah. you've currently got is yourself attacking yourself. Yeah. So let yourself feel the attack and see it as actually there's something in every one of these statements. Like does God feel your indulgent when, indulgent when you're feeling your feelings? What do you think? Didn't God no. create you to feel your feelings? Yeah. So therefore God doesn't feel you're indulgent when you're feeling them. In fact, what you'll get to a stage, you'll get to a stage when you're at one with God, you'll feel every feeling you have every moment and it won't be indulgent at all. Uh, okay. so, so there has to be some judgment going on here that's related to a fear, that's related to a fear of some belief that maybe that is true. That maybe you are self-centred. 
And a lot of these beliefs are totally erroneous, but they're not going to leave you all of your life until you feel them. And that's the issue we face. It's not until we feel that perhaps we are self-centred and even go deeper and look at all the times we were told we were self-centred and allow ourselves to feel about some of the causal events eventually, you will remember these things as you go deeper into it. But if you don't allow yourself to even see the judgment, you'll never get to the deeper emotion. So you, when you said these things to me just before, you believed these things to be true about yourself. Well, that certainly was stopping me from, from proceeding with my list. <laughs> yep. Yes, okay, thank you. And you mean your emotional list there, do you? Or, or your to-do list or your M desire no, list? No, my, my list of, of uh, what made me angry or what made me fearful or yep. whatever. Yeah. Can I also point out that all of those things will stop you having desire? Can you see why? Because that's being self-indulgent too. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that definitely is because I'm very unfocused in my life now and don't really know what I want to do. Yep. Yeah. And the reason why is you're shutting down your desire by having all of these judgments about desire your own desire. The irony is that when you have your desire in a pure manner without addictions, you will find actually that is the time you are also the most loving. A, that's the conundrum of desire is that when God created, in fact, one, I'll, I'll be talking soon about the law of desire and the law of desire is such a powerful thing to understand because God created you to have desire and if you don't have desire, Right, that actually causes a lot of your law of attraction to be very negative. It's your desire that creates very positive laws of attraction. Right? So, so whenever you have, don't feel a desire or you feel like your desire is suppressed or you feel like you don't have any desires at all, look at the emotional programming you have about self-indulgence and being selfish and self-centred and all that kind of stuff because that all prevents you from having desire. And God created you to have desire, all sorts of desires, right? Physical, like you would not eat without desire, would you? Yeah, but I do eat. Okay, so, so you have some <laughs> yeah. desire at least, yeah. right? <laughs> now what about sex? Do you have sex? Oh, I'm not married. I mean, I'm... I'm <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I'm a recent widow. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, okay. Just a no, no would be fine. Yeah. And, no. and so there's a whole area of desire there that's been turned off, right? Yeah, so, definitely. So, so, yeah. so there's that to look at. Why, what, what's there? Some, there's some judgment. One of the judgments was I'm not married. That's yeah. a judgment against this having this desire. Mm. So, so look, at, look at the desires and, and ask you, and what about emotional desires? What, what desires do you have there? Do you... When you get up in the morning and the first thing you feel, what do you feel? Um, once I get out of bed, I'm okay. I keep, keep going. <laughs> keep but going. Yeah. Is that a desire or is that just... Oh, I, I, I have a desire to, to keep busy. I think that's... That, and that, yeah, that's and not a desire. No. Well, it's... it's but it gets... That, that's it, an addiction. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm... Yeah, I'm <laughs> sort you, of messed up around. Can you see if you if if you if you can work your way through these emotions, yeah. you would then allow your desires to be more present. Yeah. And if you allow your desires to be more present, you'll actually work your way through a lot of things that way. Yeah. Okay, desire is really really good like that. So allow yourself to have these desires. These things are what are turning off your desires. Yeah. So allow yourself to see why you're turning on detuning from your desires. So, so I don't do the same thing any day because my desires are different every day. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so every single day your desires will change. If you're in tune with them, they'll change and you have a desire to do all sorts of things. Now, how is that going to affect you in your life in this world? Well, obviously, if I go to work five days a week and I desire to only go to work one of those days, if I tune into my desire, I'll be not wanting to go to work the other four days. Now, my boss might go, wow, you know, like, this person's not a very good worker anymore. They only rock up one day a week, right? 
And so I'll have to work my way through this issue of change, like the fact that I'm going to have to change my life. So a lot of times we detune from desire so that we do not have to act. We detune from desire because we don't want to change. We don't want change. We're afraid of it. My suggestion is to come to love change. You want to love change because, because you don't want to live in a desireless world. Everything you want to do will be desire in the future. So whenever you find yourself doing something because you have to, just stop. Like, you need to stop. And everyone goes, that's not very practical, you know. Like, in the course of one day I'm working for a boss and, you know, he, he's uh, wanting me to do this and that and half the time I don't want to do any of what he's saying, right? Well, then you've got to look at your reason, your addiction to staying in that job that causes you to do things you don't desire. And what might the addiction be? It might be, I'm addicted to money, a regular income stream. So therefore I'm addicted to security. I need to deal with a lot of security-based emotions. If I just leave the job, do you think those emotions will come up? Pretty rapidly. But I could even stay in the job and start dealing with them, couldn't I? But I need to acknowledge that they're present and there, that my, I have a fear of security that causes me to be addicted to working and that causes me to deny what I desire on an almost hourly basis. Does that make sense? So allow myself to... You can change this. You can change this by no longer being afraid of being unsafe, which means I'm going to have to deal with a lot of feelings about my lack of safety. Also... I might have a lot of feelings about God's not going to look after me. Like that's a lack of safety, isn't it? Like so, so in other words, I feel God created this entire universe, right? This entire universe we have, God created. And I believe that in creating all of that, God doesn't have the power to look after me. Does that really make sense emotionally? Well, of course, it, you know, from an emotional perspective, of course, if God created the entire universe, then God must have the power to look after me. Like, I was driving along, we were driving along the road the other day, out in the desert, right? And this whole flock of budgerigars just flew off the ground into the... Now, we were out in the desert, like, like it was, like, bleak, you, you know, no water seemingly. And yet these, like, 30 or 40 very healthy budgerigars, wild budgies, just flew up into a tree. Now, how did they get looked after? Obviously, something's going on there. God has the power to look after everything that God's created if it works in harmony with God's laws, right? So, so if that's the case, then one of my core causal emotions is going to be, I can't rely on God. God's totally unreliable. God's not going to look after me. God's totally unreliable. She's not going to care for me. She's not going to care for my material needs. AJ, it's totally impractical for you to believe that God's going to look after me and my food requirements like but god created everything to look after you and your food requirements it's only that we get into disharmony so that'll be a core emotion that i need to work my way through as well if i follow my desire and passion i won't get looked after is what we, many of us believe so what we do instead is we focus on doing something to look after ourselves right that is nothing to do with our passion the irony is if you focused on doing something in your passion, you'll get lots and lots of abundance in that moment. That's why, you know, most of the richest people on the planet all began by doing something they really enjoyed. <laughs> Many of them were broke before then. Right? And the reason why is desire is powerful. When you focus on what you really desire to do, Everything starts coming to you, particularly if you start putting it into practice with God's laws or in, <laughs> in amongst God's laws. So for all of you, look at this area of desire. If you can focus on the area of desire in your life, it will definitely trigger every one of your addictions. Right? So everything that you've become addicted to that stops you from feeling your desires or that causes you to feel that you're not allowed to have them or that causes you to believe that you're not going to survive if you decide to follow them, all of those emotions will be dealt with if you allow that. See how you go with that. <laughs> Thank you. We can go over here with the microphone. No, we need a microphone. Just commenting on the wisdom of what you have been saying, but 
as a younger person, and perhaps I'm twice your age, when I was your age, I had a lot more courage and a lot more desire. But I understand exactly where this lady is coming from. And once you get... I used to hope that I'd get my act together by the time I was 50. Yeah. And then I pushed it to 60. And I'm headed for 17, hoping that it, it gets right then. And I realise that it's up to me. Yeah. But sometimes my desires are not what other people who I'm responsible for or with or family. So can you give me some wisdom on that one, please? Sure, sure. And thanks for the compliment, by the way, about <laughs> being half your age. Because um, <laughs> that made you nearly 100, actually. <laughs> but uh, let's look at the issue of desire and following. Almost all the time we don't follow our desires, it's because we're afraid of what other people will think. All right? Well, you think about it. Every single time you walk down the street and you start to feel like you're feeling pretty happy and you want to skip. So how many of you just automatically just start skipping, you know? <laughs> like, how many of you do that? Right? But how many children do you notice do that? Do you, do you notice how many in comparison... Can you see the difference? Like, why does a child want to do that and the adult doesn't want to? Isn't it because the child doesn't feel the projection, and in fact there are far less projections at the child, skipping? But when an adult skips, what does everyone around think? What an idiot. Like, you know, like what's this person doing? What's, what's wrong with their head? You know, there's all these projections, right? There's, there's lots of projections at the adult for doing what the child is allowed to do right and so what we finish up happening as we grow up is we start gathering all of these environmental fears into our soul and they become the determining factor of how we live our lives right and when that happens we are now not really truly being ourselves but rather we are doing what our environment is dictating so, so my suggestion is to forget about everything that other people think you should do and focus firstly on what would love do, right? What would love of yourself do and then what would love of others do. So when you start focusing on what love of self or love of others would do, you will start taking actions that other, that other people will often project at you that you shouldn't take but you'll do it in, in joy. You'll, you will enjoy it and you'll do it in the motion of joy. Because you're, what will happen is you, you are starting now to live in total harmony there with God's laws and principles and you're also living in harmony with the law of love of self and others. And that brings a lot of happiness. It's the fear about others' opinions that causes most suppression. And it's also an additional thing occurs in our, with our fear as we're growing up. When we're young, we are not aware of the pain of our mistake. Does that make sense? So when we make a mistake when we're young, often our mistakes don't even feel painful when we're young, right? But then as, as we grow up in our life, we often start accumulating through the, our environment and usually through the environment's projection, the pains of our mistakes. And so that then determines our future course of action every single time. So my suggestion instead is to go back to those pains that cause you to now feel fear whenever you contemplate a certain action. So you're feeling joy, you feel like you want to skip. Trust me, most of you who are 70 or 80 still feel like you want to skip sometimes, right? And you don't do it. Now, one reason might be you're afraid of having a bung knee and it's going to just collapse on you, right? Another one might be that you're afraid of what other people will think of a 75-year-old woman skipping along the road. You know, they'll think, oh, what's gone wrong with her, right? And, and other times you'll think, you know, all, people will think all sorts of things and none of it's any of your business, really, what they think. Because all that matters is what you feel inside of yourself. And you're allowed to act in harmony with what you feel as long as what you feel is harmonious with love. And skipping is certainly not disharmonious with love, is it? Or truth or anything else for that matter. So when you go down the shopping centre, you'll start riding your trolley, right? 
because it's quite good fun, you know. This, a, a lot of children try to do it before their parents shut them down. Isn't that the case? Right? So, so, so I'm there riding my trolley along the aisle, right? This happens, as Mary knows, on every time we go shopping. And I get these angry projections from these older ladies in particular, <laughs> right? <laughs> Saying to me, what's this idiot doing? Do you, do you know? And the truth is all I'm doing in that particular moment is just enjoying myself as anybody would when they've got some wheels that have got a big heavy balance on the front and they can actually use that to ride, you know. And so, you know, and it's amazing how fast you get your shopping done because <laughs> you can just, you know, push yourself off down the aisle and before you know it you're at the spot and just put on the skids and away you go, right? And you're laughing, but it, this is a, this is what happens every day when we go shopping, and and so and so what happens is that we get to the point where we're willing to just be ourselves, no matter what is thrown at us, and and when we get to that point, we will feel free of fear. It's the fear that dictates a lot of our very very um, negative reactions to our own desires, for example. There is no harm in doing everything that you desire as long as what you're desiring is harmonious with love and truth. There is no harm in it at all. The problem we face is the world that we live in defines a lot of things as unloving or, untru you know, or untruthful or unloving or wrong. And in reality, it's got nothing to do with love at all or truth at all, but it's got everything to do with the fact that you know, the reason why particular older ladies project at me is they are afraid that I'm going to hit them with my trolley. Does that make sense? That's what, what so they see me boring up, right, <laughs> down the aisle, they're going, <laughs> you know, and all it is is they're afraid that I won't love them, that I won't take notice that they're there. Does that make sense? And the truth is I stop way before I'm near any person when I'm doing it because I'm care, because I love them and I don't want to hit them, I don't want to hurt them. And so I love them, and so I've got a whole free aisle. Of course I'm going to go down that <laughs> pretty quickly, right? Until I get to a person, near a person who's, who, who um, I don't want to hit, and I'll just stop and say, thank you. <laughs> and and uh, as Mary knows, there's quite a lot of looks that we get in the process. But the beauty of it is that, you know, if I love them, I will not do it to their detriment, right? But I can still enjoy myself. And that's what eventually will happen in, in your own life. If you love a person, you won't do something to their detriment, but you're allowed to enjoy yourself and you won't be driven by a fear of displeasing them all the time. So what ho often happens when we're shopping is I get lots of rageful projections at, from people that I have had no effect on whatsoever except triggered their fear. That's, that's all that's happening. And they're afraid that I might do something. Right? I remember one time I was sitting on top of this, um, this was some time ago, there's this, um, where I used to live there was this railway line going out across a great big ravine. And the ravine was probably, you know, a couple of hundred metres wide and maybe a hundred metres deep. And they hadn't got sidebars on, on this railway line. You could just walk along it a hundred metres above the, above the ground looking down in between the rails, right? And, and it was awesome because you could go right out in the middle and sit down and then there was a creek going along the middle and you could take a collection of rocks with you and just, you know, how you do this thing, you just drop them down and go, they go down and down and down and down and then hit with a splash, you know. And, and so I'm just sitting there with my two sons um, dropping these rocks down. Anyway, this group of people come walking along they're at least 50 yards away from where these rocks are dropping. Mm -hmm. And yet the man turns around and swears and curses at us for doing it. And he's saying how, you know, it could have hit her, his daughter or son and it could have hit him and, you know, all these kind of things. And yet we're like ages away from them. So what's going on? What's going on is that other people often feel fear from what you do but that doesn't mean that what you did was not loving you follow me just because someone projects at you their rage which is a result of their fear it doesn't mean that what you did was wrong right 
And even if it was wrong, if you have a feeling of repentance for it right at that moment, there is no, there is no need for their rage anyway, really. So what often happens is we finish up getting controlled not only by our own fear, but we also then get controlled by everyone else's fear, which then turns into judgment. So my suggestion is stop letting yourself change your life just because somebody judged you. Allow yourself to deal with the emotion inside of yourself that got triggered when you were judged. Now, can you see, as life progresses and our age accumulates, many times these fear-based experiences accumulate. And so often by the time we're 40 or 50 or 60, we have a lot more fear than when we were 20 because we don't release our fears. We, we started with our fears when we were very, very little, usually in a very early childhood, and those fears keep on getting dumped on and more dumped on and the more dumped on us and more dumped us. By the time we're 25, we've now been through a few relationships which had their own fears added, and then it gets, gets more dumped on us and more dumped on us. By the time we're 35, we've had quite a few jobs that were all added to our fears now, and that gets done. And you can you see by the time we're getting to 40 or 50 now, we're getting afraid to even act because that might happen or this might happen or that might happen or this might happen. What we need to do is release these fears, uh, which are all covering, of course, causal emotion anyway, a fe grief. Release the grief. And what will happen is that you will no longer feel afraid to act at any age. Right? So you'll have the same feeling that you had when you were 20 and you'll be 70. And you'll have the same feeling as to what you can do. And ironically, because you've released a lot of the emotions too, your body will feel a lot of times like it's 20 or 25 as, as a part of that process. Can, can we have the mic there? So, If we can flick the... Uh, can we turn it on? <laughs> Thank you. I might just share my secret with a room full of strangers. Yeah. So I like to think that I still have that great joy of life and great joy of living and I met a man from Newcastle six months ago and we've got together on about four occasions anyhow I thought he was here with me for the last five days and um, I think it was around about last Friday when there had been a really heavy downpour of rain mm -hmm. at Noosa mm -hmm. so out of the blue I said to him when the rain stopped, let's go to the beach or could we go to the beach? Yes, that's fine. And we've been to the beach for morning swims. That was, that was okay. So I was so elated to have sort of spent some glorious moments with him that I said, this might sound a bit bizarre, but I'm going to wear my fur coat down to the beach. So it <laughs> it's just covers the, the pubic hair. Right, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> I also put pink feathers around my neck. Yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> and anyhow, I'm very impressed now. As, as we were going, <laughs> as we were going out through my front door, I said to him, "Do you like this?" <laughs> and I was naked underneath. You gave him a flash, did you? <laughs> awesome. The stretch of Noosa Beach is not very long, I yeah. don't know, three, four hundred yards. Yeah. And it was, I've been going to Noosa for the last 25 years and lived there for the last 13. And it was magical down there. Mm. No one else. <laughs> and I said that to him. And anyhow, we didn't even get to the row of rocks that protrude and with no um, verbal communication he turned around and started walking back and I said to him what's happening why are you doing this he said I'm not enjoying this and I have been he left next day yep. and then when he got back to Newcastle rang to say I I can see no um, no value in c in um, having further communication with you mm. and I have never done that with anyone else yeah. so I'm pretty pretty 
Heard about that? Yeah. So, so what was happening there really was that you, through your childlike actions, mm -hmm. just triggered a man's emotions that he couldn't cope with himself. He, he had his own response to that. His own response was one of fear. He was afraid. And maybe he was afraid that, you know, you might flash yourself to somebody else or maybe he was afraid that somebody would catch him or somebody would, would look at you and think he's There was stupid. no one there. But it, yeah, but he was afraid. And his fear dictated all of his subsequent actions. And this is the problem is that, is that oftentimes we do a childlike thing and then get hammered for it, right? We then get, like, treated badly because of the childlike thing we did. And then we go down the track of, oh, I shouldn't be childlike because of that event. And my suggestion is you need to allow yourself to be as childlike as you were in that moment and you will eventually, when you work through the underlying emotion, attract a man who's going to really love that childlike expression. I said to him I wouldn't, couldn't imagine any man in the world not being absolutely wrapped to have a lady like that on his arm. <laughs> I agree totally. Like, <laughs> anyway. I agree totally. And, and, and there's, something, there's something in that for him, like in terms of his emotional... There's something emotionally going on for him, obviously, in that, pro, in that issue. So, so th and this is probably what I'm saying, is that, is that often events occur where we were childlike, we get judged for it, which is basically what's happened to you. You've gotten judged by this man for the actions that you took. And as a result of that judgment, we feel the pain of it. The key now is to go into that emotionally because there is still some pain in there from obviously very much earlier experiences where judgments occurred in your life. Release that and then you'll feel free to do what you did that day anytime you want. Not this afternoon though. <laughs> <laughs> I what? only had the courage to tell you the truth thinking that other people here might be able to um, accept what you have just said to yeah, me. Otherwise, yeah. I'm very private. Yeah, I realise that. But it's very nice you mention it because, because it illustrates the point, doesn't it, that, that often when we are ourselves completely, we get very terrible judgments from others, which then create hurt within ourselves that we often try to avoid the experience of. And all we need to do is feel the feeling of it and then go and do the same thing again, <laughs> right? The only time we don't do something is if it's unloving, right? So, that, so we need to stop. We need to start channel, challenging this world we live in with loving acts, love towards ourselves and towards others. Ian up back there. I'll be 72 in April and I volunteer at the local retirement village and, and I have a lot of fun there, particularly with sing-along. I get in the middle of the group and I dance around with a pair of maracas to the beat of the music and, yeah. and I got lots of smiles and, and a lot of sort of people coming out of themselves. Yep. Uh, anyway, that's just something about where I was having a lot of fun. Yeah. I want to share with you. And it's very, very important to start connecting with the fun things that you like doing. Like you see a lot of times on the Divine Love Path, many of you get stuck in the emotional sadness, right? and we do have a lot of grief that we do need to experience, but we get into this place where we no longer do things we desire, right? And the key is to stay desirous. In fact, if you grow on the divine love path, you will actually see more and more of your desires and start following them. But the desires disharmonious with love will always finish up creating some pain at some point. And we need to allow ourselves to feel that pain and release the pain. But you'll find that as you grow, more and there will be more and more desire in you. And that would be very, very good. That's excellent. AJ, can I just go back to this string of uh, emotion that sure. you're talking about? Um, I know there's been a couple of times I've got into my causal emotion <laughs> and I feel like I'm only crying for like, you know, maybe 15 minutes, but then I feel empty. And mm. I know it depends on whether our law of attraction changes or not, but I'm just wondering, can you get to a point when you're in your causal where you feel empty, mm -hmm. but there is still more there on another layer? Certainly. Of, okay. Yes, yeah, certainly. And that happens quite frequently because it, the reason why is that often we have a blockage at that point, so we have a fear kick in at that point that prevents the rest of the emotion coming up and the next natural thing we'll need to do is deal with that fear. Does that make sense? So, and we're not often conscious of what the fear is, even intellectually, 
And so we're going to have to now work through what the fear is from an emotional perspective, which means discovering it through your law of attraction. And so, so well, oftentimes you'll feel the emotion for 15 minutes, all of a sudden it'll feel like it's all dried up, and then you, you might go off doing something else and then realise, oh, there's still more there, but it'll come up late, later. What we often do, myself and Mary, is if Mary or myself has cried for 15 minutes um, and then it stopped, we'll often discuss what the block must be, well, like what the fear is. Um, and that helps a lot. Sometimes after you've discussed what the fear is, you can get straight back into the emotion again because you've released the fear. Does that make sense? It just depends on how you deal with it. Many people don't deal with it that way. They cry for 15 minutes and say, oh, you beauty, it's all over now. Gee, that was great, right? And then a week later they go to the same emotion because, and then they say, oh, this stuff doesn't work. But the reality is that every emotion often will work for a short period of time until we hit a fear or a blockage and we've got to deal with that fear or blockage before the next group of emotion, the next part of that emotion can be experienced. When you think of a lot of childhood events, a lot of childhood events didn't happen all at once. They happened over a period of time and often that period of time was like, like for example, mum said something to you, you started to feel sad. When you started to feel sad, mum said another thing to you, don't you be sad, you know, or I'll give you something to cry about. Then that made you feel scared, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then you shut down. So can you see how every event got created through a series of events usually? It's not just like one bang event that just happened all at once, but it's often a series of different events that caused the suppression of an emotion. And often when the release of the emotion, a series of unlocking events will also need to occur in order to get it, that emotion released. So is the level of our releasing um, equivalent to the level of our allowing ourselves to fear or the desire to let go? Because I know I've heard some people say, I've been working on this issue for six months. Does it have to take six months because that's how much grief's in there or is it dependent upon our allowing it? It's very dependent on our humility. Remember, humility is the desire, the passionate desire to feel and experience every one of my emotions. So if we define humility like that, our release of any emotion at any one time is very dependent on humility. Most of us are still developing humility, which means we're coming from a place where we're not very humble. In other words, we have no desire to feel our emotions. We want to do you know, everything but feel our emotions. And then we're stepping slowly into a place where we want to feel every emotion. So, so at any one point in time, you could say that we're progressing in humility, which also then means we're progressing in the process of allowing. So, so when we begin, our allowance won't be very strong at all and our desire won't be very strong at all, a, a real heart desire, I mean. And we have lots of blockages. And so we might cry for five minutes and then it's all dried up and you know, three weeks later we cry for five minutes again and then it's all dried up. And then after a while it's, like, oh, we cry for ten minutes now and it's every week, you know. And then after a while it's, oh, we cry for 15 minutes now and every day. Do you know what I mean? Because what's happening is we're slowly stepping into this process of being truly humble and in the process of doing that we have more allowance and more desire to actually feel everything we feel in the moment. And so you, you can't expect yourself to go from blocked to completely open and humble emotionally in the space of one sitting. So it all speeds up though? Yes, it all speeds up. And then what happens is it speeds up until we get to usually there's some crux or, or crucial issues in our life emotionally. And the crucial issues in our life emotionally, there's usually five to ten of those really crucial issues that we have the most resistance to. And that's the time that we need to be diligent in actually working our way through our fears rather than stepping into anger all the time. Because we can actually stay in anger all the time with those crucial issues. So the key is to allow the emotional process, the opening, the opening of humility to continue to occur until you get to the stage where these crucial issues come up and you'll feel them because they're the ones you have the most anger with. Does that make sense? Every crucial issue is the one I have the most anger with. So what I do then is I know I'm in a lot of fear here. The, the anger is proportional to the fear you're in. So the more anger I feel, the more fear I'm in. So my anger and fear are very much related. So I allow myself to see the fear I'm in, 
and understand, wow, this is a crucial issue. I'm in a lot of anger here, so this is a big issue for me. And I need to allow myself to even start discovering this issue, becoming aware, noting down, writing, be diligent in facing this particular issue. And when you face those particular issues, you first will have a lot of fear to deal with and then a lot of grief. And those, the grief of those issues may take a day, two days, even a couple of weeks to deal with every day. Those crucial issues are often core to change. And when you go through them, that's when you'll actually feel huge law of attraction change. So up until that point, you often feel gradual law of attraction change. Till you get to a crucial issue, you get stuck a little bit on that crucial issue usually because we have huge amounts of fear and blockages to it. We've got to release the blockages and fears to that crucial issue and that might take a week, a month, it might even a few months, might even six months, right? And then and the little bits of dribble of emotion coming out then. And then all of a sudden we release the last blockage to that crucial issue and all of a sudden it will just come out of us like a dam bust over a period of a week or a few weeks. And after that, your law of attraction will change quite markedly. And that's what's basically happened to me with all of my processing, that kind of process. And you can't be humble to everything when you've got so much fear because fear is the blockage to humility as well. So you, it's a matter of working through your fears and letting those things occur. Now, we just I think it's 3 o'clock, isn't it? 10-2, um, is it? Okay, so another 10 minutes. We'll keep going for another 10 you come down the front. Um, AJ, one of the things about fear, I've been looking at my own fears, is that um, uh, I think I'm afraid to discover more about myself. Yes. And um, it's discovering what I've done and what could have been done, because I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And as I work through them, I find that I'm discovering more. And I think... That that's what's stopping me is that fear. Mm -hmm. um, many of us at the core level have a belief that we're horrible, mm. right? So it's just like I am a horrible person. Now, can you see that that straight away if I'm afraid of feeling that, that I am a horrible person, I will actually then usually get into anger every time somebody sort of implies or even suggest something that makes me feel horrible. Mm. So straight away I'll get into the anger. Because we have a core feeling that we are a horrible person inside of us and that often comes from deep emotional projections from our family and in our childhood, right? And it also comes from a lot of belief. Uh, you see, but, but from the time you are born to the time you're seven, you're being barraged with all these adult suppression type emotions but you have yet to actually have an intellect that's able to sort between the truth of them or the error of them. So what's actually happening with all of these emotions coming into your soul is they all feel true. So if somebody projects at you that you're a terrible person, in that particular moment as a child you will often feel that you are a terrible person. Does that make sense? Because there's no way of sorting out whether the person who's projecting it at you is, tr is right or wrong. And there's auto an automatic acceptance of these emotions. And so, so what happens to the child is the child automatically accepts the emotional projection from their environment, which then establishes a belief. Now, as an adult, the reason why that doesn't happen as an adult is after we release our child causal emotion, now the truth <coughs> can enter us and we're able to discern the truth for ourselves. And that's a very, very different process than what the child is capable of doing. The child is not capable of discerning whether the big adult standing in front of them yelling and screaming is actually in the wrong. All the child does is feel, this little child feels this a big adult there yelling and screaming saying that the child is wrong and the child is going, I must be wrong, I must be wrong, you know, I must be bad, I must be... Do you know what I mean? That's what the child is automatically doing because there's no way for the child to determine any difference. This is why projection of emotions to children is so damaging because it enters them as truth when it's not true at all. Right? And so as it enters them, they then believe it and we now grow up as an adult but inside of ourselves we're carrying around all of these childhood emotions and beliefs that we still believe to be true. And this is where 
we need to allow ourselves to experience them. And so in the end, yes, many of us will have this feeling that we're horrible people and the more truth that comes to us, the more horrible we feel about ourselves until we have a big grief session about how horrible we are. And then when we go through that grief, we'll come out the other end and say, hey, I'm not that horrible after all. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because once we release the grief of how horrible we are that has been projected on us by our environment, we're now able to receive the truth that actually God created us to be totally different to that. All right? And this is one reason why the persons who have done more damage to others have more of a difficult time on the divine love path. Because the more damage we've done to others, the more horrible we feel about ourselves. And then we want to prevent that feeling and we fight against that feeling and resist that feeling. And what God, God is, when you think about it, what God's trying to do in this whole type process through the law of attraction is trying to expose this feeling within us at some point. And that's why some people need to be near the point of death before they'll feel these feelings. Whereas others don't need to be near the point of death before they'll grieve and feel those feelings. And the reason why we sometimes need to be even past the point of death and in the spirit world for a thousand years before we feel those feelings is because we just don't want to feel what we feel about ourselves in the end. And if we can allow that feeling, which are the most powerful feelings to work your way through, I've found, what happens is that you can be, you're then in a state of real humility and you can process through lots of emotion very rapidly like that. But it's very hard for us to get to that point because in the end we just come face to face with the fact that we feel we're a horrible person and the truth is that many of us have done horrible things, right? But even the bigger truth is many of us have done what we believed to be horrible things at the time which weren't horrible at all. But our parents and our environment and everybody else said it was horrible. And we now believe them to be true too. So in the end we do start to feel that we're a horrible person. It's not a divine truth but it is a feeling that we have within ourselves. Now what we often do in a new age environment is we would say, no that's not true. That's not true. Don't tell yourself those messages anymore. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Uh, what I'm saying is you won't change your thinking until this feeling release, releases from you. The, the thinking, I'm a horrible person, comes from the feeling, I'm a horrible person. And until that feeling exits through grief, you will believe that no matter what anybody tells you about yourself. So you can, you can enter a loving relationship where the man just adores you. And he thinks you're beautiful and he thinks you're wonderful and everything else. But while you feel you're horrible, you'll never believe him. And the same applies to your relationship with God. You see, while I feel I'm horrible, I'm never going to believe God's viewpoint of me. Can you see that? Because I have this belief that saying, no, God, you're wrong. I'm actually horrible. Does that make sense? And while I feel, while that feeling is in me, it's not my intellect. My intellect can be going, I'm a wonderful person, I'm a wonderful person. My intellect can be thinking. But at the same time, I could be feeling that I'm actually not inside of here. And it's the feeling that relates to God. So in my feelings, I could be projecting a God, I'm a horrible person. You're not, gonna, you're not able to love me because I'm a horrible person. And the truth is you will not feel much of God's love while you'll feel you're a horrible person. So you need to feel it and release it. So experience the grief of it and release it. Now you are open to feeling love come from God and you'll realise that if God loves you, you can't be as horrible as what you thought. Does that make sense? So um, is it to the fear of being a horrible person is then to feel being horrible? Yes. Let yourself feel that you're horrible. If that's what is there, if you're afraid of feeling it, feel it. Let mm -hmm. yourself feel it. Right? When you feel it at the causal level, you will not live in it. There's a big difference between living in it and feeling it. Most of us are avoiding the feeling of it and it's the process of avoiding the feeling of it that causes us to live in it. And what I mean by living in it is that what we do is we're afraid of feeling I'm a horrible person. So what we do now is every time something happens in my law of attraction that triggers this emotion that I'm a horrible person, I go into rage with the, with the cause. 
of that. So, you know, some guy comes along and, you know, he, he uh, you know, he, he just projects at me sexually or something. And then when I start to talk to him ab about it, you know, he gets angry with me and then walks off, right? And, and some, in that interaction, I'll feel I did something wrong. I'll feel I'm horrible, whatever. And I'll, I'll go into that emotion inside of myself and, it, and, and live in it. And then and instead of, and by living in it, what we do is we go, oh, he treated me bad. He treated me terribly. What a, what a you know, FNA or whatever we might call him, right? And we might, just, we might just swear and curse about him and get really upset. All we're doing right at that moment is living in the fear of the emotion he triggered in me. Does that make sense? And, and by living in the fear of the emotion he triggered in me, I'm not dealing with the emotion. All I'm probably going to do is get angry and upset, angry with myself, angry with him, whatever. But, but when I actually deal with the emotion, oh, he felt I was a horrible person. Maybe I'm a horrible person and go into that emotion. When I release that causally, in other words, trace it back eventually to how in my childhood I was felt I was horrible, a horrible person, release that, that's when my law of attraction will change. So I'll get treated as if I'm horrible less. But not only that, that's when I will no longer have any fear about others' perceptions of me. No matter what they feel about me, I won't react. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to go into those terrible emotions about yourself. And, and they're going to come up naturally. Just let them come up naturally. You don't have to go searching for them. Your law of attraction will bring them to you. And the key is to go into them when they come up, you know. Go into them when, when the law of attraction brings them to you. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. And we'll make this the last one before our break. Thank you, AJ. Um, so as a horrible person and having done horrible things that have caused death and injury to other people, mm -hmm. by releasing that horrible person emotion, does that then undo? I don't know what the word is. Yes. Okay, so let's be specific. Um, I've had multiple abortions in my life mm -hmm. that ended um, the progress of children. So there's a feeling in you that I'm a murderess. Yeah, it's worse than horrible. Yeah. It's unforgivable ah. action. No, it's not unforgivable. It is. Well, that's my question. If I get to that, that see, horrible I'm start, feeling, starting to feel it here. Yeah, yeah. If I get to that, the horrible feeling, horrible person feeling. Yeah. Does that then fix it, for want of a better way of putting it, for the children whose lives I ended? Yes. It fixes it not only for them but also for you. Right? Can, can you, remember, you remember I've talked very often about this process of repentance and forgiveness. Right? When we allow ourselves to feel the emotion, this is the emotion that I need to let myself, that what I did was a horrible thing, right? And I talk to God about how horrible I see it is. Now that leaves me open emotionally for God to heal the underlying causal emotional reason of why I chose to do it. And so I would need to not only just feel that I'm a horrible person, so that's an emotion that I need to feel, which is emotion of sorrow and grief, right? Mm -hmm. Then what I need to do is allow myself to feel that sorrow and grief and talk to God about how sorry and, and uh, and how horrible I feel about myself, and be truthful about it and stay in the emotional experience of it and pray to God for God's love to just help you through that process. Now, when that happens, what God's love does is it can reach in and get help us with the causal emotional reason why we chose the act. So with every single abortion that you've had, you've had a causal emotional reason why it was chosen. Does that make sense? There was some reason inside of yourself that caused you to sacrifice life for the sake of it so to, for the sake of the projection uh, the protection of an emotion and what will happen is god when you get into this state where you fully allow your sorrow about the act god can now reach in and help you deal with the emotion in other words the real reason why you chose to abort a child 
will rise within you and be released. And when you get rid of that reason, you will no longer feel horrible. You will feel a sense of peace after that. So then it's the same emotion that's caused harm to my living children also in feeling that emotion. Um, will that then help? Um, I don't feel it is the same emotion that's caused harm to your living children also. You don't? By the way, um, just something to bear in mind for all of you. Whatever happened at a certain snapshot in your life was caused by different emotions that are unhealed at that particular moment in your life. So what I've found generally is that a person, for example, that might have had, like I know one lady that's had 34 abortions. Right? Now, now, every single one of those abortions had some common threads through them. Does that make sense? That where there was a common thread of her not being able to cope with her life and also, in her case, her husband forced her to have these abortions, is her terminology. Of course, she decided to remain living with him. She wasn't trapped in living with him, but she felt forced by her husband to have these abortions. So, obviously, her husband's very culpable for a lot of these abortions, but, but her emotions are... One of her emotions is she had to do what her husband wanted and she felt like she had to do it so much that she had to get an abortion. So that's the causal emotion. Why did she have to do what the man wanted? There's got to be something in that, you see. And if she allows herself to feel fully the emotions of all of those abortions she had, that emotional thread, which was through all of her abortions, can start to be released. Does that make sense? It, and she will, God can help her release it if, God, if she prays to God about that particular feeling being present. And then a, as that occurs, she will no longer feel like she's got to do what the man wants, which is one of the main reasons that caused her abortion. So she'll feel free of actually the man dominating her. Does that make sense? So if I go back to each particular event and try and connect with God's help and remember. Yep. You will find the cause of the reason. I'll why. find a common thread, but I'll also find the other emotions that that may be unique to each different decision. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. So I've had discussions with women who have had, say, three abortions, and in each case the emotion driving each abortion was very different. And the key is to deal with the emotion that drove it. Right? When you allow yourself to deal with the emotion of drive it and you feel the sorrow and the repentant spirit, that's when God can reach in and take away the memory, the emotional memory of the event. So after that, whenever somebody mentions the word abortion, you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I've had five of them. And instead of feeling this terrible heavy heart with it, you'll feel like it's all gone. It's just You're now just saying, oh, yeah, I had five of them and... Yeah, I had terrible emotions about it. I, I felt this and I felt that and I felt this and I felt that. But once I released all those emotions, now I'm free of that. I can feel myself free of it. I don't feel guilty or ashamed of myself anymore. I know all the reasons why it happened. I've dealt with all the reasons why it happened. I feel really good. Let's talk about your abortions. <laughs> you know, you, you'll actually be able to help others get to the same place. As well as that horrible emotion, there's a very self-condemning... Um restrictive kind of a feeling in there that um is it it's anger with self jen you know, whenever you condemn yourself you're angry with yourself right anger with self is a is a denial of a fear so understand the way you treat yourself and the way you treat somebody else is identical what i mean by that is is if i'm condemning of myself that's the same as me being condemning of you do you see that? It's the same emotional reason why I'd condemn you. What's the only reason why I'd condemn you? Because I'm denying something deeper in myself. So therefore it follows that if I condemn myself, I'm denying something deeper in myself that I don't want to experience. It's the same process whether it's with you or with myself. So whenever I am ang angry with myself, condemning myself, blaming myself, judging myself, I am just in this state of avoiding my fear about something within myself. Just the same as I would be so if I was angry with you, condemning of you, judging of you, all of those things, now I'm still avoiding something that I'm afraid of within myself. It's exactly the same principle whether I'm angry with you or with me. Do you see what I'm saying? Most of us do one of two things. We either project our 
fear externally, which means we become angry with everyone else and we blame everybody else and we are upset with everyone else, or we project our fear internally, which means we go into self-blame, self-hatred, self-loathing and all of those things. Or we do a combination of those two things generally. Right? The key is whenever I'm doing it with you or with me, I'm still in self-deception because I'm still not getting to what I'm afraid of dealing with and I'm still not getting to the causal emotion. That make sense? So just allow those causal emotions to come up. God doesn't want you to punish yourself incessantly. All God needs us to do to help us is to feel our emotional reason why we did it. You see, we're taught in this world that when you do something wrong, you've now got to punish yourself for the rest of your life about it. Right? So what, what does a murderer do? A murderer ha commits a murder, and whether he's sorry or not is immaterial, he spends 20 years in prison. Does that make sense? Whether he's dealt with the reasons of why he did it or not is immaterial. He spends his 20 years in prison because we all feel we've got to exact the justice. Now, God's not like that at all. God's much more loving than that. God doesn't exact justice from us. All God wants is for us to feel the emotions that caused us to do what we did and to release them. When we release them, from God's perspective, the whole thing's finished. And that's the beauty of dealing with God compared to dealing with people. Can we, we'll have a break now and then maybe Anna, you can ask after.